Cultural agility is a leadership skill many executives, managers, and entrepreneurs typically don't think about, but the ability to work effectively in and with people from other cultures is increasingly important as domestic workplaces become more diversified and as more businesses expand their markets overseas. It can be challenging, but today's guest offers some guidance for more success. This is Business Confidential Now with Hannah Hassel Kelchner, helping you see business issues hiding in plain view that matter to your bottom line. Welcome to Business Confidential Now, the weekly podcast for smart executives, managers, and entrepreneurs looking to improve business performance and their bottom line. I'm your host, Hannah Hassel Kelchner, and I have a super guest for you today. She is Paula Caligiuri a distinguished professor of international business at Northeastern University. She researches and consults in the areas of expatriate management, global leadership development, and cultural agility. And she's the author of Build Your Cultural Agility, Nine Competencies of Successful Global Professionals. Paula has been a frequent expert guest on CNN and CNN International and is an instructor for LinkedIn Learning Courses. She was a semifinalist for the 2021 Forbes 50 Over 50 for co-founding a public benefit corporation, Skillify, to help foster cross-cultural understanding. So it's a real honor and privilege to have her here with us today. Welcome to Business Confidential Now, Paula. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Hannah. Well, you know, it's really interesting, this term cultural agility. People talk about diversity and, you know, the need for that and the value that goes with that. But I'd really appreciate it if you could help us understand what you mean by cultural agility. Absolutely. So cultural agility is just a basic ability to work comfortably and effectively in different cultures, places that are new, contexts that are new to us and with people from different cultural backgrounds, people who are demographically different from us. So it's that idea of being both comfortable and effective in different cultural contexts. Why do you think that's so important? Oh, gosh, it's, it's been critically important. You know, our cognitive evolution has run faster than our biological evolution. So we as humans, you know, we're, we're actually most comfortable, we're most at ease with kind of our own quote unquote tribe, the people who we've been raised with, people who we're, we're familiar with. Yet the world doesn't work that way anymore. You know, we are, as you noted, we're multicultural. We work in multicultural environments and our clients are diverse. Our vendors are diverse. We need to be comfortable with that. Yet it's naturally a little easier to not be. So, you know, hey, we're smarter than this, right? So we just have to gain some skills in order to be good working with people who are different from us. Well, that's a great segue to my next question. How do you go sure. about developing cultural agility? Because I would imagine that if you grew up in an ethnic neighborhood or had immersive foreign travel experience, that you'd be more sensitive towards certain cultures and certain customs. But not everybody has those experiences. And even the people that do, they're limited experiences. So how do we fill in the gaps? Yeah, it, it's so... Interesting. Your question sort of reflects sort of a fundamental understanding of what we all believe cultural agility to be. And that is people with lots of passport stamps must be good at cultural agility or people who have studied abroad or lived abroad or lived in a multicultural neighborhood must be good at this. And actually what we're finding both in research and in practice is that it's not exactly that. It's a nurture nature combination. So the nature being that some of us are just naturally predisposed based on the way our bodies handle serotonin and dopamine and, and that kind of bubbles up to our personality. Some of us are just naturally predisposed to being more open, more curious, more resilient when things go wrong, more humble, being able to say, I, I don't know what this situation holds or being able to linger longer in situations that are, are new and different to us without needing to sort of fill in the gaps and, and, and believe we don't know the answer. So there's a very much a nature side to building cultural agility or to understanding cultural agility. But then what happens is our nature interacts with the nurture, the things you described, 
working abroad, living overseas, having a multicultural community, working in a multicultural workforce, having multicultural team members, having those opportunities to interact more. And what we see is that it's that combined effect. So that's a long, long answer, but it's that idea that if you have the awareness of sort of where your start point is sort of that, what gives you a little bit of anxiety, and then little by little put yourself into situations of greater novelty, you eventually start to move the needle from your start point. So you move the needle on cultural agility by not putting yourself in too much novelty, but also by uh, giving yourself some of those challenges. Well, I appreciate that on an intellectual level. But as you mentioned before, people are tribal. And, <laughs> and and getting more so, it seems like, you know, they like to be in their echo right. chambers. But, you know, besides that, because we did grow up in tribes, right, you know, as we were younger, mm-hmm. we, we probably have certain stereotypes. So how do we overcome that? Gosh, I do a lot of executive education, certainly through Skillify, as you named, but also I'm a university professor, as you noted. So I spend a lot of time doing some very basic exercises to overcome stereotypes. And one of the ones that by far has the the most profound effect is I have students take a tool called MyGuide. So it's M-Y-G-I-I-D-E. It's a free tool. They can go on to MyGuide.com and take the tool. So the first question is, you know, you, you do an assessment of your own cultural values. The first thing I have my students do is compare themselves. Instead of comparing themselves to what their values to another country, I have them compare themselves to their home country. And right away, they can start seeing that they are not exactly the, the values of their home country, which is a great exercise in saying, look it, if you're not the exact values of your home country, why would anyone else be? And then we do the next step. So if we have a multicultural team or a multicultural workplace or a multicultural group, we start sharing cultural values. And what very quickly students or executives will see is that they share more values than they have that are, are different. So it, it helps to basically turn on the stereotypes by saying, look at, we share socializing agents. We are either you know, of the same generation, or we're from the same, you know, we have the same major, or we're from the same socioeconomic background, or we're of the same gender, whatever it might be, that give us something in common, and that's reflected in, in our values. So some of the best ways to teach, it, it, we too often say, you know, don't stereotype, that's bad, but this kind of helps us understand it from the inside out. What a wonderful tool. I'm going to put a link on that with your episode information on the website so that people can go and do this in their own privacy. (laughs) Because I'm sure, you know, some people are going to be, oh, well, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm curious, you know, how biased am I? Let me understand this better. But they might be reluctant, (laughs) you know, to, you know, do it out in the open. So we'll keep that link out there. Now, your book, Build Your Cultural Agility, Part of the subtitle is that there are nine competencies that help leaders be more successful. And I would imagine not just leaders, but employees to be able to interact with their coworkers. And like you said, perhaps their their vendors or their customers. So, you know, there's this tremendous cross section out there. Now, I appreciate we don't have time to talk about all of them. Uh, and I wouldn't want to give your whole book away. But I am curious about, <laughs> about which ones you feel someone should start with when working to improve their cultural agility. What are your thoughts? Wow. It's like asking which one is your favorite child. Exactly. (laughs) Which one of the nine? (laughs) No, no, I'm I'm just teasing. So so I would say if there was one to start with, so if you think about these competencies, they actually bucket into three categories. There's the idea of how you manage yourself, so self-management competencies, in a new and novel situation that's new to you or around people who are demographically different from you. So self-management, and then there's relationship management. How do you do you manage the relationships that you're in with people who are demographically different from you? And then there's task management. How do you manage the tasks that you're in, that you're doing in those new contexts? So from the self-management you know, bucket, I would say probably tolerance of ambiguity would be the best one. So that's the idea that your brain is able to comfortably move into situations of novelty, something that's new to you, something that gives you pause. And it could make you happy. Like it could be first day of a new job or first time with a new team or first time meeting a new client. 
it's something new, right? And right away, our bodies are naturally triggering the new is challenging, new is a concern, right? And so our brains need some time to develop that skill, tolerance for ambiguity, to be able to say, look it, I'm not going to try to explain this. I'm just going to try to observe it, to try to understand it. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to try to get to know people. I'm going to try to understand the situation versus trying to explain it because we'll always use our old scripts to explain something new and and that almost always is wrong. So tolerance of ambiguity, it's a skill that we can build. It's a competency you can build. Some people are just naturally better at it than others, and that's okay. We can all move the needle. And that just takes a little bit of just understanding your start point and, and moving from there. That's one of your favorites. Well, you know, it's interesting <laughs> that you mention it because, you know, the novelty of a new experience and just absorbing it all, you know, it's one thing when you walk into a room and, you know, you you have all five senses that can, you know, help you figure out what's happening, what's going on. But what happens when that encounter is virtual and you mm-hmm. really don't have all five senses working for you? You're limited as to what you can hear, what you can see, and you don't even have the benefit of all the body language. Right. Oh, Hannah, and that, yes, that is such an important point now because what I'm seeing a lot ever since, you know, COVID started and everybody's moving meetings to Zoom, which is, is wonderful and convenient, but sometimes it's helping us forget that we're in a multicultural situation. I, you know, you think about if you have a, a business trip in another country, think of all the work you have to do, right? You get the plane ticket and you have to get your passport and you have to get your visa if you need a visa and you, have to, you fly over and you get bags and you go to a hotel. Like there's all these, these things kind of hitting you with you're in someplace new and different, reminding you of that fact. So, you, you know, you're already in a state of, of awareness that something's different. Well, exactly as you described, when now you're having these meetings, but they're from the comfort of your home office or, or wherever, right? And now you're losing those signals and those cues that someone might be responding to you in a different way or someone might be, you know, kind of attending to your attire or your approach or your verbal cues and interpreting those in a way that you don't intend. So it's it's basically, you know, we're, we're sort of letting our guard down, if you will, in a way that we cannot shut off our subjective process or the, the, the way that we respond to one another through a subjective lens. So the best we can do is recognize when we're in a multicultural situation and to be comfortable with reading the environment and, and trying to mirror and respond as needed. How much do you think time pressure contributes to a lack of cultural agility? Whenever humans are under stress, they cling to familiar. It's why there's, you know, comfort food in every culture, just to kind of use a simple example, you know, whenever we look, whenever we're under stress, time pressure is a stressor. So if you start putting people under, you know, massive deadlines, all of a sudden, we go into situations already with our kind of emotional stress, our cognitive stress, our stressors are already dialed up, in which case our brains will really quickly move to cognitive closure. Like we want to understand the situation quickly. And we do this at a subconscious level. It's not as though we're doing it in a way to rush the situation or, or to ignore the culture. It's just our brains are responding as, as they do. So yes, time makes it worse, <laughs> unfortunately. Now, for people that mm-hmm. are trying to gain more cultural ability, but that are just kind of fumbling, stumbling, whatever. What are the biggest mistakes that you see people make in the area of cultural agility? That's a really good question. I think people assume that if they go and study all the do's and don'ts of a culture, that they'll, quote unquote, understand it. And and actually, culture is not, you know, it's not a here's a list of five things you need to do when you work with a different generation or when you work with someone from this other culture, because people are, we're human. We've all been socialized very differently. And one of the biggest mistakes is adhering too closely to all of those do's and don'ts. It's great to understand what they could be almost as kind of a selective attention, if you will. So if you see something that, that is consistent with what you learned, you'll know how to respond. So training's good, 
but it often can lead us astray and making us respond in ways that are not appropriate for the situation. So awareness building is really important. That same tool that I mentioned, that M-Y-G-I-I-D-E, my guide, will also give people lots of advice for free on how to work with people from different cultures. And we did it in such a way that we didn't overgeneralize or over over stereotype. We just kind of give people things to look for. So probably the biggest mistake would be preparing in a way that you believe that now you have the answer. That's just not true. The answer is you need to go in and read the situation. So then the second one would be you need to read the situation, right? So you need to give yourself time to actually understand the context, understand by talking to people, understanding people who understand your context in a way that they can kind of almost be um, an ambassador for you or, or, a, or a guide, if you will, to help you understand the situation you're in. And frankly, just don't take yourself so seriously. Like I always laugh, I, my students I teach both graduate and undergraduate when sometimes I'll say a word that I'm 55, right? So a word that makes perfect sense to a 55-year-old will make all my students laugh. And I always joke, I say, well, okay, what did I just say? What does it mean to your generation? Because here's what it meant to mine. It's a great example of a cultural situation. You know, you have to kind of be able to laugh at it in both directions. You know, it's honest, honest mistake. Yeah, honest mistakes. I, I love that example. You know, but keep in mind, you're the one giving them the grade. So, you know, how much are they going to give you, right? <laughs> I do have an advantage. <laughs> you have an advantage. You got an edge, right? You've got some power right. there. It's a, it's a teachable moment to laugh, about, to be able to laugh at yourself, right? Yes. You know, admittedly. Yes. Hey, it's, it's their culture, not mine. You know, there's more of them than me. <laughs> well, that's okay. One day they'll be 55 and they'll, they'll see what it's like. <laughs> it's okay. These things all come around, you know, it's kind of funny. But you know, mm. all right, I've read the do's and don'ts. And I hear what you say, don't adhere to them strictly. You know, they're, they're not a straitjacket. And I'm going into a situation. Mm. And I'm trying to be observant. But I screw up, Paula, I screw up. Yeah. What's a good way to sort of come back from that? I mean, I'm not the teacher. So I, you know, I don't have that opportunity, like you just said. But let's say I'm in a business meeting. And I really did a boo-boo. What do you recommend? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's a really, it's a really important question because one of those nine critical competencies is resilience. And resilience is a critical competency for culturally agile professionals for that exact reason. Things will happen. Mistakes will happen. Missteps will happen. You don't know all the rules when you're outside of your home culture, when you're outside of the way you've been socialized there's a much higher chance that something's going to go wrong, but it's not ill-intended. You didn't, you know, do anything intentionally wrong. So some of the best ways to get around it is to be honest and say, oh, sorry, from my culture, asking questions this way would have made sense, but I understand now that that was inappropriate and I'm sincerely sorry if I offended or I certainly didn't mean to overstep here or, or, or whatever. In my culture, this means X or in the way I was brought up, I was always taught to do it this way or the way we did it back at my old organization was this way. And I'm sorry, I thought it, that was what was needed here. I needed to learn more about the context. So it's okay to say, you know, here's the reason kind of going backwards. Here's the reason why I did what I did. Explain your behavior in a way that shows that you are acting in a way that would have been appropriate in a different context and then moved forward and say, here's what I should have done to learn the context here. And let's make sure I don't, you know, don't do that again. <laughs> so, so how can I learn this? You know, and just, I mean, I mean, I'm sort of using this with a lot of gravity in my voice, but you can do it in a way that's just very open and, and sincere. It's okay to not know. I appreciate that because I think sometimes people are afraid to fess up when they mess up, you know, mm -hmm. that they would lose face or because or they lose uh, respect or power or whatever in the situation. But I, I agree with you. If anything, it mm -hmm. makes them more trustworthy and more endearing to show that they are vulnerable, they're human, they're trying, they're making an effort to understand and be respectful. And yeah, everybody makes a mistake. I think people recognize that and can forgive. I think that's a, a common yeah. thing across all cultures, <laughs> uh, being able to forgive. 
it might be worth messing up. Just, well, you know, while we're talking about this, so, so cultural agility isn't always adapting. So, so far, everything we've spoken about is the idea of adapting to the context that you're in, which is great. But there are some situations where there's different approaches that are needed. It's why we called it agility, right? So the idea that sometimes we absolutely need to adapt to the context that we're in, but sometimes we need to hold a standard. So it means that we need to behave in a way and act in a way and reinforce a way that isn't normal and isn't accepted and isn't typical in that cultural context. So it could be reinforcing your organization's, you know, safety or ethics or production schedules or something that's just different in that context. And that's where, you know, that's where the diplomacy skills and the persuasion and motivation and a different set of skills start to kick in that you sometimes do have to behave in a way that's culturally inappropriate because you're modeling a new behavior. And in which case, you, you know, it's okay. So I, I don't want to overcomplicate this, but I want to make sure that we, we realize that sometimes we do need to hold the standard of, of a situation that we're in and, and shape the behaviors of others. Well, like you said, it's the power of persuasion and cultural agility, if I understand you correctly, doesn't mean we're pushovers, but we're not bulls in a china shop either. Right, exactly. And deciding, and sometimes if you have to be a bull, hopefully not in a china shop, but if you have to be a bull, you're a very, you know, bull that's very light on its hoofs. (laughs) <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you can finesse it in a way that you get done what you need to get done. That was a really bizarre metaphor. But yeah, you, you understand what I mean. You know, yeah. you want to be able to, to, to do things effectively in a new context, but not necessarily, you know, always just adapt to the context that you're in. Right. It's Sometimes that, you do. <laughs> that diplomacy piece that, that you were talking about. So. Right. This is great, Paula. I really appreciate your time and all you do to help organizations develop more cultural agility and raise awareness of the need for cultural agility. So if you're listening and you'd like to know more about Professor Paula Caligiuri and her book, Build Your Cultural Agility, that information plus the link to that diagnostic tool she mentioned several times is all going to be on the businessconfidentialradio.com show notes for this episode, including a transcript of this interview, because sometimes you might want to come back and find a particular point, or sometimes it's just faster to read than to listen. So thanks for listening. Be sure to tell your friends about the show and leave a positive review. We'll be back next Thursday with another episode of Business Confidential Now. So until then, have a great day and an even better tomorrow.